Well, good morning. This is Friday, the 17th of April, 2020, and we're now about three and a half weeks into the Corona pandemic. And this morning, I'd like to talk to you about something a little different. Uh, Jeremiah 18 tells the story of Jeremiah. The Lord told him to go to the potter and watch the potter work on the wheel. Well, this morning, I want to talk to you about one of those experiences where God spoke something to me, uh, actually over a period of a uh, whole afternoon. And I don't know if you ever had this experience where God will just get a hold of you on something and you just look at it and he begins to talk to you and link it up with different things. And this morning, I want to talk to you about crock pot cooking. Uh, some people call them slow cookers, but us old folks, we call them crock pot cookers. So we know what we're talking about here. And uh, before I get into this, uh, a little disclaimer to all you that are cooks. Um, this may not be uh, gastronomically exact what the Lord showed me, but I'm going to share what he talked to me about when I saw the crock pot. Well, crock pots are what they call reduction cookers. In other words, they cook things down. <clears throat> and the Lord said to me, uh, behold the crock pot. And, and he said, you know, you take all kinds of stuff. You take um, uh, potatoes and onions and uh, uh, meat, and you don't have to have a sirloin to put in your crock pot. In fact, sometimes you use just trimmings, uh, chuck tougher, tougher things of meat, and all different kinds of things. Uh, you can even, God help you, put rutabagas in there if you want. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but anyway. So you cut them all up, and you put them in the crock pot, and then you add a little water, and if you're really fancy, you'll add some beef stock, and you put that thing all together and put the lid on it. Now, the purpose of the crock pot is to take those raw materials and produce something that is a savory stew that people will want to come and eat and partake of. Now, to blend those things together, you could put them all in a big blender and hit the button, and they would be blended together. Everything would be all together. But who would want to eat something like that? I mean, it's not, it's nothing, garbage. So to make it palatable and something that needs to be served out you need to put it into your crock pot. Now, uh, my cooking friends tell me that what's going on inside that crock pot is what they call the marrying of marrying of flavors. All that stuff cooks down together and becomes a savory stew that can be passed out and people will come back and lick the plate and ask for more. And even during the time that it's cooking, you, you, you get that aroma, you walk into the house Whereas the crock pot cooking and you go, you know, something, something smells pretty good here. Now, you could look over and lift the lid, but that's not necessarily a good thing. Sometimes you have to give it a little stir. But God said to me, life is like that. What I do with my crock pot is I take all kinds of disparate things, people, and put them all together and blend them together in my crock pot. And what comes out of there is a savory stew that can be served to everybody and they'll want more and they'll come back for more. Now, the lid keeps the stuff in the crock pot so it can't get out. And that's very important. And what God uses for crock pot in our lives is the circumstances and the situations that we find ourselves in. Right now, in view of what's going on with this pandemic and the, and the panic, we'll call it the, the panic pandemic, is a crock pot for God's people. He's putting us all together, using a circumstance to keep us locked in so that he can do this work that's needed to be done to produce this savory stew that can be passed out to everyone who wants to come in around. Now, circumstances are the crock pot the Lord uses to make us into this savory stew. 2 Corinthians 2, verses 14 to 16 says this, Now thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ, through us, he diffuses or gives out the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ, among uh, whom we are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, we are the aroma of death leading to death, the other, the aroma of life leading to life. Mm. And who is sufficient for these things? Mm. In other words, we as the body of Christ are supposed to give out the aroma of Christ. And um, again, when they make perfume, for example, fragrances, flower petals, rose fragrances, you have to crush the petals to get it out. You have to process them. 
So you and I are now, I believe, in a time where it be, we're being processed in God's crockpot to marry together some of those things that have been too compatible. You think about the apostles. Now, there's a lot of conjecture about them. There's been a lot of study done of them. But here's this group of men, okay? Now, there were others besides the apostles. There were disciples, a bunch of people. There was fishermen. Rough, ready, tough people who worked outside all, all the time. They were, and Peter, I believe, was a man might have been pretty quick with his fists. He didn't put up with any baloney, and he was quick there. There was Matthew, the tax gatherer. Now, this guy was a was a Jew who curried up his favor with the Romans, and he bought the position as tax gatherer because he collected the taxes. Anything else he could extort out of the people was his. So he made himself a very wealthy man, and he was soundly hated by all the Hebrews. And then in that group, you had Simon the Zealot. Now, who were the Zealots? They were a group of people who dedicated themselves to overthrowing the Roman rule, and they would cut the throat of any Roman they could get away with it. Plus, they particularly hated Jews who cooperated with uh, the Romans. So here we are in God's crockpot. Now, what happened is when these guys went from place to place, they walked. From Galilee to Jerusalem was a three-day hike. They didn't ride in their uh, Suzuki or in their Explorer. They walked, mostly. And so that means if you ever walked all day uh, like that, and at night you camp out in the field, uh, guess what? If it's raining, guess what happens? You get to walk all day in the rain. You get to sleep wet. <laughs> And all these things that happened. So there was a lot of opportunities for friction to take place between these disciples. And they didn't get along all that well. Remember the story of James and John? Their mother came to Jesus and petitioned, Hey, can my boys, you know, my boys, James, can we sit on the right and left hand of you in your, your kingdom? Now, the other disciples were ticked off about this. They were not at all happy. And they were always arguing about who was the greatest. So you see the heat was on in this crock pot. But when they got through, when, when the Lord got through with them, they were made into a savory stew and mm -hmm. they went out into all the world. Yes. Well, so something happened. So now we're in this time where God is cooking us down to our essentials. It says in, in uh, John 13, verses 34 and 35, this will be the mark of Jesus' disciples. It says, see how they love one another. Now, how are they gonna know that we love one another? if they don't see it in our actions, if they don't see it in our lives, act it out between us. We now have opportunities to love directly one another. Uh, there's been testimonies about our church, Covenant Life, and others where I've been. People that weren't saved, they walk in and they said, you know, there was something there. The, the people looked like they really cared and loved for one another. Well, that's that sweet aroma of Christ that comes out of the crockpot cooking that we're involved in. And that's the mark of our disciples. Our discipleship is this agape love being demonstrated in the lives of all our friends and the people that come in to observe us. And in case you don't know this, you are uh, under constant observation, whether you know it or not. People watch your life. They watch how you react to this crisis. They watch what you, act with, what you do with your family, how you interact with one another. Hebrews 5.8 says that Jesus himself learned, to think, learned obedience by the things that he suffered or the things that he went through. Through this time is an our opportunity to learn new obedience to the voice of the Holy <laughs> Spirit. And if Jesus went through that and we're his disciples, guess what? That's how we learn obedience also, is through the things that we suffer. So instead of trying to complain or run, let's look and see what God wants to do through this time so that yield to the cooking, yield to the marrying together, and knowing that God is producing something real and good and savory that'll bear much fruit down the road. I want to just close with two scriptures here. First one is Isaiah 55, 6. And it says this, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and he will abundantly pardon. Now you say, well, I'm not a wicked man. I'm a, I'm a Christian. Well, unfortunately, Christians can do wicked things, and we can find ourselves doing things that are not pleasing to God. 
So therefore, this is a time to seek the Lord while he may be found. My experience is this. Whenever God has removed me from my normal lifestyle and set me aside, whether it was going away someplace or a situation like this, he had something that he wanted to say. And it was up to me to seek the Lord now while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And he's near with those who suffer. Nearer than uh, a lot. Of, well, he's near all the time, but we're more aware of him. And the other scripture is Second Chronicles, Chronicles 7, 14. Very familiar. It says, if my people who are called by my name, that's you and I, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and heal their land. Do we want to see our land healed? It's incumbent on the church to do that. Now, that's kind of a scary thought. So are we willing to humble ourselves? Yeah, that we can do that. Are we willing to, to uh, seek his face? Yes. Are we willing to pray? Yes. But are we willing to turn from our wicked ways? Those things all go together. You can't separate them out. Then God says, if you do that, I will hear from heaven and I will hear your prayers and I will heal your land. And we know that our land needs healing. So to sum it all up, don't waste this time. Now is the time for us to take positive action in seeking the Lord. May God arise. May his enemies be scattered. God bless you. Thank you.